letters, they're letter numbers, is the seed. And in the seed is the whole. This whole can be, and is expected to be, grasped in the Beit, Resh, Aleph, Shin, Yod, Tov of Bereshit. That's the first word there. This sequence is the revelation, is in the revelation, and those who grasp it are in the revelation and are, in action, the revelation itself. What he's saying is that there's some sort of a secret, some sort of a numerical, mathematical, some kind of a coding in the sequence of letters that make up the text, and that they represent the revelation, the deep meaning of the text. And what the other rabbis were saying, um, and this is knowledge that would have been known in, in early Christian times too, these aren't recent uh, understanding. This is recent quotes, maybe a thousand years old, but they're not. This isn't new ideas in Judaism, so they were. This is true in the Christian world too, although I doubt many Christians or Jews know about it. the The text itself is kind of like. It's like a a, a source, a plenum, a, a a. In the physicist world, it'd be like a manifold of potential possibilities, and then when an event happens, the letters are grouped together, and vowelization is added so that there's a story meaning that comes out that corresponds to the history. At least that's what the rabbis are saying. Um, you have to know about Hebrew to understand that, that there aren't any vowels in Hebrew. The, the letters, um, the alphabet is up on top here. All of these letters have consonantal values, valueless consonants. The, the vowels are little notations that are added, and I don't think there's any vowels at all. I don't think I even drew any vowels, no. The vowels are little symbols that are placed either below or above the letters, and they have vocalization. Also, um, the original texts, as I've drawn it here, aren't broken up into words. Um, how you break up the text into words and what vowelization you put on the clusters of letters gives you a great range, a great freedom in what story it ends up saying. So I wanted to, to leave you with a sense that, that there's room for there to be more here than a story. And then the question is, well, what is... I'll tell you what, what Meru is, why we're calling our foundation Meru Foundation and what the Meru Project is. The word Meru has meaning in many different cultures and languages. Um, most of you may have heard of it as the name of the world mountain that exists in the midst of the land of Shambhala, where one incarnates in the Eastern traditions if one is sufficiently advanced that one's not going to fall back. And so you, you climb Mount Meru to get to Shambhala. And Shambhala sits in the middle of, uh, Meru sits in the middle of Shambhala. World mountain, so it's like Mount Olympus or, or any other world mountain. It also turns out in Indian tradition to be the name of the Pascal Triangle. Now the Pascal Triangle is an unfoldment of numbers that are, are like the golden mean proportion. They all sort of add one to another. And they, they mimic the growth of all living things. The sequence of numbers, the Fibonacci series, the Pascal Triangle, the golden mean proportion, that's the unfoldment proportion for the geometry of all living things. And that mountain, that, that unfoldment is called Mount Meru interesting connection. The name of the Hebrew alphabet is Meruba. And the Meru part refers to what I'm, as I will show you, to the vortex shape. And the Ba in Hebrew, from the letter Be, means box, means container of, means in it. So we have some sort of a vortex and a box. Now the word Meruba to ordinary discussion is said to derive from the word arba'a in Hebrew, which means fourfold, which means four. So meruba would mean fourfold. If you think of the fourfold, if you're thinking flat, which is, I'll have to erase my little fade here to get a little room. If you're thinking of the fourfold and it's flat, then it's a square, which is what most people believe that meruba, the arba'a, refers to, the name of the Hebrew alphabet, because the letters are kind of square shaped. The letters on the very top, they're kind of square. But if you're thinking in three dimensions, which is a much more accurate model of our world, then the object that looks square, that's fourfold, is the tetrahedron. It looks like a square if you hold it just so. And so if you were to draw it on a piece of paper, and then the Inquisition would have come along and kill you off, which happens periodically, your successor who tried to interpret your drawings would misidentify what you had drawn. And one of the reasons why I believe what I've got up here hasn't been known for a long time is because that's exactly what happened. The Inquisition rolled through periodically, the generic inquisition, if you will, for the last several thousand years. And notations and drawings were drawn flat and were soon to be flat when they were rediscovered. But they should have been drawn three-dimensionally. 
and if they, were th if they did represent three-dimensional objects, then the text that accompanied the drawings would make sense instead of read like poetry only, which is often how they're translated. Um, the root mer itself in the Romance languages refers to the sea. I think that comes from its basis in wave motion, this vorticular motion. Um, there's also another form of, of Mount Meru, and that is in the Eastern tradition, there is a very famous mandala, the mandala of creation, the Sri Yantra, and it is supposed to exist in a Meru form, which is shown to be a set of stacked plates. In fact, the transformations that I'm going to show you on the Hebrew text also work on the Eastern tradition, and if one takes the flat Meru mandala, and pulls it out in three dimensions, you can see the, the same mandala, and if you look straight at me as I scan around, and then one can see the real structure of why there would be a mountain called Meru. And we'll uh, hopefully get to some opportunity to play with that. I also have a little model here that lights up we can play with later. All right, that will serve as a sort of introduction. Let me show you what I did and what I found and then let's talk about the significance of it, which is probably the, the greater part of the discussion. I think the easiest way to, to tell you how this all came about is to tell it to you historically. I was uh, sitting in my apartment in Newton, Massachusetts in 1968, and I had this urge to look at the beginning of Genesis in Hebrew, which was a strange urge considering the fact that I didn't read Hebrew, although I did know the alphabet. Now, I have one talent in this world, and that is I'm a visual pattern recognizer, as maybe has become evident already. <laughs> um, and my eyes fell on the letters, and I could not get it out of my head that there was something peculiar about the sequence of letters. It just didn't look like language to me. Since I couldn't read it, that was a further reason why it didn't look like language. <laughs> um, if it had looked like language, if I had been a good student in my earlier days and had learned to read Hebrew, I would have, just like you pick up a piece of paper in any language, you don't start counting letters and look at letter patterns. You simply read what's said there. And I never would have seen this. So I asked around, assuming that Genesis was the most heavily researched document going, and people told me they didn't know what I was talking about. I asked a rabbi, I asked a priest, I went over to MIT, I went over to Harvard, I, nothing. Eventually people told me this must be Kabbalah, it must be Hebrew mysticism. <coughs> I'd never heard of Kabbalah, um, so I decided I'd better get educated if I was going to figure out what was going on here. And I realized that if no one knew about this, and there really was some kind of coding in the letters of the text of Genesis, then this could be very important. And we'll see why that may be. So I, uh, I read just about everything I could find in English on Kabbalah. I read Hebrew material, I read Christian material, I read Arabic material, I read Greek material, the Pythagorean mysticism, I read some Eastern material, um, I read stuff printed in green ink from people who had been up in flying saucers, I read stuff written by very conservative rabbis who really didn't like to write anything down at all and say as little as possible. And I started to put together a sense that even though I couldn't figure out what they were talking about, it was very nice poetry, and yes, there might very well be meditations involved. Um, the literary criticism methods that the academic scholars used to make sense of Kabbalistic texts didn't do much for me. Yes, I could see you compare this sentence to that sentence, but that didn't tell me anything about what the author was saying. It just told me he was saying the same thing here as here. And eventually, after 10 years, I started to build up the sense that these Kabbalistic texts were talking about something. There was just too many details for it to be pulled out of the air. There was just too much commonality to be, to be the, these texts to be the individual experiences of, of, of mystics. There was, there was something that bound it all together. And it didn't matter if I was reading Rosicrucian material or reading Sanskrit material in English translation um, or, or Hebrew material. It, it all seemed to have the same underpinning. And many others have claimed this too. That there, there are numerous teachers in, over the centuries who, who claim the same thing. Um, but I wasn't satisfied by them simply telling me it was all the same. It didn't look the same, it just felt the same. So the idea was to find out what was going on. Well, what did I do? I didn't know what to do. It was really rather, rather confusing. I had the first verse of Genesis here. Um, if I use the names of letters, I'll use the English equivalent letter names, because I think everyone will know them, and not everyone will know the Hebrew or the Greek names. 
And they all, they're all in parallel, at least almost all of them. Towards the end of the alphabet, there have been some substitutions. So um, Ben.